Amen. So we are in his presence, yeah? We are in God's presence. I believe that. We just worshiped. We just prayed. We've praised him. Now we get into his word and his word begins to speak. And I believe you're here for a reason. Whether you're online or in person, the idea today in this series, Generations, is more than you know. Can you say that with me? More than you know. More than you know. God is more than you know. He has more than you know for you. And as we look at it today, we're going to step outside of Hebrews 11. We're going to look at a different passage in Scripture. And as we do that, we're going to look at it from different angles. And I believe the Spirit of God is going to speak to you in ways that encourage you to go forward because God has more than you know ahead for your life and the life of our church. Now, when we get into this idea of Father's Day, You know, for some of us, it's a great thing. For others of us, it's a painful thing. And in all of that, you need to know that we have a heavenly father who is more than you know, always able, always available, worthy of our worship, able to be trusted. Can I get an amen? Anybody who can attest to this. I mean, this is who he is and what he has for us. And I'm blessed that I get to be a dad. I am in my 22nd year of marriage to my wife, Cindy. Here's a family picture. Uh, this is from Mother's Day, actually. And uh, can you tell I'm a proud husband and father? Come on, y'all. That's my family. Within there, you have ages 10 to 19, two 10-year-olds. No, they're not twins. And uh, we love our children dearly. And actually, it was the 10-year-olds yesterday uh, that had uh, just this funny moment with dad where they're like, hey, when you use some of our words and language, dad, it's, it's cringy. Like, if you say the word cringy, that's actually cringy. I was like, oh, we're at that point. You see, I went through that phase with the older two, but now I'm going through that phase with the younger two. So it's a ton of fun, and it is such a gift to be able to do that. As I uh, reflect on some of my childhood, there was a couple of movie franchises that meant a lot to me that I just absolutely enjoyed. Here's a picture of two of those main characters, right? Darth Vader and Superman. You have Star Wars and obviously the Superman franchise. And when you think about those two characters, uh, no, they were not in a movie together. Don't Google it. That's just clever editing. And, uh, And yet there actually is a true story, believe it or not, that the actors, the original actors, David Prowse, who played Darth Vader, was a bodybuilder, and then Christopher Reeves was, uh, he was chosen to be Superman, but he was so skinny that they came to David Prowse, the, the Darth Vader actor, and said, hey, would you be willing to train him and pour into him and help him put on some weight because we know he can't fill out the Superman suit? True story. I looked it up, and he actually helped him over a few months period put on about 42 pounds went from 170 to like 212 and so uh, he was able to play Superman wouldn't you have loved to have been in that gym you know to see Darth Vader and Superman training together like how crazy is that and uh, and yet when you think about these franchises I believe that part of why they were so powerful is both were dealing with the issue of dad think about it for a minute Darth Vader, spoiler alert, right? It's been a few years. I think I can get away with this. I think most of you know his son was Luke, the protagonist and real hero of Star Wars. It was this battle of good versus evil where uh, Darth Vader had chosen the dark side and Luke would choose the good. And, And so there was this constant saga and story unfolding between dad and son. And then Superman, right, released to Earth to save humanity from his father and mother. He he ends up being raised for a period of time by an earthly father until he begins to recognize some of the powers. And then as his earthly father uh, passes, he actually is then left in a bit of an identity crisis through many of the original movies, figuring out who he is and and how do I show up. And, and, And neither of them realizing, you know, like maybe for us, that there's something inherent in our stories that are meant to connect to an earthly father and where possible to, uh, I'm sorry, to a heavenly father and where possible to an earthly father. There's actually a story in the Bible that speaks to the heart of the father and illustrates more than you know, right? This idea that we're looking at today. 
We're going to go to Luke 15 if you want to turn there with me. And it's actually in Luke 15 that we see one of the most famous stories, not just in the Bible, but in all of literature. The prodigal son is what this is known as. And I just want to let you know that there's more than one prodigal in this story. That there's actually two sons, and we'll see how that unfolds, and even a father who bucks against what tradition and culture would say to do in order to show his heart and love for his son who has returned. Let's get it started here in Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, just to be clear, he's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I don't want to wait. Can you give me the inheritance now? That's a pretty accurate translation of what's unfolding. He says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Can you say reckless? in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. Can you imagine? He left everything in his own reckless living. He's now disillusioned, disheartened, and beginning to even eat pig's food because it's all that it's available. There's a longing inside each of us that's God-sized. It's the heavenly Father-sized. And often when we begin to get away from that, we make choices or we're the recipient of other people's choices that then affect how we're living. Verse 17, notice what happens next. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. He began to wake up. He began to realize that that actually maybe there's more than you know that God, the father, his father would provide for him. He began to wonder what could happen. As we think about this, as I said, we want to look at it from a number of different angles today. And one of those is actually the story of Pastor Randy, our worship pastor. Some of you have heard parts of his story. Some of you haven't heard any of it. Most of you have never heard what's unfolded in the last year. There are things in his story that when you think about where he was at in life and and the things that had happened around him, that you would go, I don't know if there's any more for that guy. And yet you and I get to stand and receive from him every week because God can do more than you know when the heavenly father's love begins to fill our hearts. Amen. So Pastor Randy, if you'd come out and join me, he is going to sit with me in a God at work moment. I'm running wingman now. He's running point. And uh, as he shares this, Uh, I just invite you to sit back and to really receive what I believe God wants to share through his story because he's a husband, a father, and a grandfather that in many ways, it's only by God's grace and the heavenly father's love that he's able to do this. So can we give him a hand? And because, and because I'm a grandpa, I need to put these on or I can't, or I can't see but I also just want to say before I start, um, this is the, what I'm what I'm going to share is not to compare what I've walked through to anybody else in this room or anybody else who's watching online. This is my story. This is unique to me, and it just outlines the fact that our God is a redeemer and He can redeem anything. Amen. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but also that um, I wrote it for two reasons. Uh, one was because as I prepared it, it came out exactly the way I think God wanted me to share it. But then also because I realized this morning and earlier today, uh, it was more difficult than I thought to share it. Uh, so I'm going to lean into the, to what I wrote so that I don't mess it up. (laughs) So here goes. Uh, This is a story about fathers. My story is an example of God providing his best plan for us regardless of our circumstances. I look back and realize at every turn God provided a father or a father figure in my life. 
If we all were to reflect on our, on our stories, we can usually identify those fathers God provided along the way. I'm relentlessly following by faith because Jesus has been so faithful to me. I was adopted in Oklahoma City at 10 days old. Oh, there's Pastor Randy. <laughs> I was adopted and I brought and I and brought into a loving family with one older brother. There it is. The Brady Bunch called and want their hairdos back. <laughs> That's my older brother on the far, wait, to be your far left, yeah. My mom was an incredible, generous, and compassionate person. She went to be with Jesus just last year, and we all miss her terribly. And as much faith, who she instilled in me, this is a testimony about how the fathers in my life ha both had faith in me and gave me the faith I needed to trust the Lord through an uncommon life. From the earliest, from my earliest memories, dad was a huge influence in my life. Most of my childhood, he was a music professor at Anderson College, and early on, my love and passion for inspiring music began and has only grown throughout my life. There he is with my brother and I. That was my brother's graduation. I think that's 1989. In many ways, dad was the reason I ended up following the Lord's calling into music ministry. Through his passion for inspiring and spiritually uplifting music, he gifted me with a love for sacred God-honoring music that over time drew me close to God. My parents divorced in 1984. I was 13. And at the time, my youth pastor, his name was Randy Bargerstock, became a surrogate father to me. My dad struggled with PTSD from the Vietnam War. That was a trip to Washington we made. He's standing in front of the Vietnam memorial there. He was unable to be a healthy presence in my life. Randy was the reason, uh, my youth pastor Randy was the reason I didn't abandon God altogether. And he was a positive and guiding presence in my life as I sorted through my brokenness. In 1991, my mom got remarried, so I gained a stepfather, Mort Krim. There they are together. I was already an adult, so while my relationship with him was great, it was long distance. Mort taught me about responsibility, about generosity, and how to think deeply and to defend my beliefs and my faith. That next year, my dad nearly succumbed to bacterial meningitis, leaving him uncommunicative and a shell of the man he had become. He was transferred from one long-term care facility to another for about seven years until he passed away the day after Christmas in 1998. I was 28 years old. This Christmas, he'll have been gone for 25 years. Thankfully, before dad had gotten very sick. He and I were able to reconcile a lot of deep relational wounds between us and he had rediscovered Jesus. Not just as his savior, but the Lord of his life. Dad showed me how to persevere and overcome adversity. <clears throat> Jamie and I had only been married for four years when dad passed, and I, I had developed a great relationship with my father-in-law, J.C. Campbell. There's J.C. Awesome, awesome. Everybody in Lexington, Ohio knew J.C. Campbell. He was kind, fun-loving, and brought joy to our lives. And he passed away in 2014. Hmm. I also have a special relationship currently with my mother-in-law's husband, Dean Poor. There, there we are. We have a good time together. Uh, he loves Jamie's mom well. And he has taught me to appreciate nature and God's creation more deeply. Nice. He has a garden out in the backyard. He just, he loves to garden and be out there in nature. It's awesome. So at this point, I want to make sure to recognize the best person I've ever met, my wife, Jamie. Without her constant love and support, I would not be here today and, I, and not be the man God created me to be. She has loved me and been by my side despite the crazy baggage that I brought into our marriage and relationship. So with so much loss and change, 
God kept father figures around me as I reflect. He blessed me to personally experience fatherhood. As Jamie and I welcomed three children into our lives between 1994 and 1999. Yeah. <laughs> There they are. And that's why I'm gray. I became a a father (laughs) and it has beautifully changed me forever. I think we're at an apple orchard or something on that one. Zach, Emma, and Riley showed me a new capacity and facet of love I had not yet experienced. And because I had been adopted, for the first time I was seeing my likeness in other human beings my children. Up to that point, I hadn't seen myself in anyone else. As their father, loving, protecting, providing for, and being present and available for my children were the goals I felt both a responsibility and compulsion to fulfill. It is a privilege and blessing to be their dad. On May 6th, 2021, I became a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Nate, for repping that Pathway student's hat. And today, I have two granddaughters with a grandson on the way in July. Yeah. Grandparents are like, yeah. I love being a grandfather. There are no words for how special it is to have grands. There they are. Madeline Jean and Emery Irene, and Irene was my mom's name, by the way, are life-changing blessings. Um, and they love their pops. It causes me to remember my grandfathers who were both pastors and how indirectly they were father figures along my journey as well. Strong, resolute, consistent, and devout. Three years ago, I decided to take the search for my biological mom to another level. The adoption agency I was adopted from offered a reunion service for those who wanted to connect with those in their biological bloodline. I started that process during the COVID pandemic with no success in finding my biological mom. One of my kids said, dad, why don't you look for your biological father? So I did. And not expecting much, I started the search process and within two weeks, amazingly, the adoption agency had located and contacted my biological father. And he immediately was willing to connect. And that's him. (laughs) I have now spoken to him multiple times, texted him, and even FaceTimed with him. My children and grandbabies have even interacted with him. Very early in on our communication with each other, there were unavoidable similarities and wonderful discoveries. Bio, Dad was a musician. He even had played trumpet, as I did in marching band, and he sang in a quartet, as I did in high school and in college. I'm grateful for how, oh, and he has bad knees. (laughs) And I have terrible knees as well, so we share that. I'm grateful for how genuinely interested he is in seeing where this relationship leads and how kind he has been with Jamie and our children. Finally, then after a long wait, two months ago, just two months ago, I was reunited with my biological mother. And that's her right there. She is so sweet. She's, she's been through so much and she's simply just amazing. And uh, these reunions have been unexpected and awesome and have reminded me of God's faithfulness in my story. And again, as I said, God's a redeemer. He can redeem anything. Amen. Any broken thing he can fix and redeem. Again, I have relentlessly followed by faith and Jesus has been so faithful in my journey. God has always provided a father in my path if I had just been looking or if I could just reflect and see and and realize whether by title or by relationship, a father has been there from the very beginning. Being a father myself has been one of the greatest blessings in my life. So adopted in Oklahoma City at 10 days old and look what God did. 
That was Mother's Day here at Pathway. Amen. And you can see Emily there. She's expecting. Um, being uh, so, And even in those short seasons when there seemed to be no father in sight, the Lord himself faithfully filled those voids with the, with the loving and gentle reminder that he has been my true and constant heavenly father all along. That's my story. Amen. So incredible to hear what the Lord can do, isn't it? And uh, yeah, let me just pray over you. And uh, if you're comfortable, stretch out your hand. We're just going to honor this moment and what God can do and has done. Father, we thank you for... Uh, Pastor Randy, thank you, God, for your hand on his life and just the testimony today of how you work through generations, redeeming, restoring, reconciling, even recently uh, being able to connect in the last year or so with his uh, biological father and mother. God, that is so unexpected, but you can do more than we know. You are so able and so good. Father, continue to bless him and his family be with us, open our hearts, that we too could walk by faith and receive all that you want to do. We thank you and we honor this moment and what you've done. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Love you. Good job. God is so good, isn't he? And uh, when you think about a story like his, you think about the text and how we make choices and we do things that, that maybe get us outside of, of what God has for us. That's the heart of the Father is to restore and to bring us back, to invite us into a space with him that only he could do and only he could orchestrate. I mean, that's what faith does is it moves from the pain, moves from the situations back to what is possible with a God of the impossible. And in this story that we're looking at, we have a prodigal son who is left, who got disillusioned and now wakes up and begins to realize the air of his ways. If you're taking notes here, I want to get into the message for a few minutes here and give you some things to, to hold on to. The first is that rebellion and selfish living, I had you say that word reckless for a reason, because selfish living is reckless, cannot change God's love for you, but it can cause you to miss more than you know. You see, the the amazing thing is you and I may be tempted like the younger son was to get selfish because of our own pain, because of our own story, and we can become reckless in how we live. Now, you you may look at it and go, well, I'm not living recklessly like he was, squandering money and, and spending it on all the wrong things, but maybe for you, you're selfish in a way that is an act of rebellion. And the amazing thing about God is that doesn't change his love for us. That, that it doesn't change that, that he loves you as much as he ever will right now in this moment, even if you're rebelling and living in selfishness. It's amazing that, that God is there and able. And what, what we can also learn from this younger son is that provision is not the same thing as presence. That, that actually he said, give me my inheritance. And, and he found that that wasn't the same as being present with his father. You see, provision without presence often leads to disillusionment. You you can have everything you think you want, but if you don't have presence, fully present, you know, with God's heart, fully present with those around you, you will find yourself probably just like this younger son, disillusioned. I I could get further and further into this, but the bottom line is we've seen the stories. People that climb the wrong ladder, chase the wrong thing, maybe even win a lottery and find out that it alienates them from the people they love the most and they find that they were climbing the wrong ladder or receiving the wrong things. Provision without presence will create often disillusionment. And so that's where we pick up the story, right? Is he's woke up, he's decided it's time to turn back to the Father. And as you think about that, there are things that maybe start to tug on us that we realize are causing us not to be present. 
You know, I don't know what it is for you, but I, I know that for some, you know, you may remember the story Malcolm Gladwell put out a few years ago. It's popularized the idea that 10,000 hours of anything will make you an expert in whatever that is. And, and statistically right now, the average male by the age of 21 will have spent 10,000 hours playing video games. What does that mean? It means we have the second generation now, mine probably being one of the precursors with the Atari, <laughs> then the Nintendo, then PlayStation, all those things, that has grown up playing in a world that isn't present in this world all of the time. What am I saying? I'm saying that it's possible that we're experts in things that actually are creating our own disillusionment, our dis detachment from the thing around us. You know, men, we can turn to video games to detach, but if that's consuming us and causing us not to be present with those around us, it will create disillusionment in them and maybe in us. Maybe for you, it's not video games. Maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a grandmother, and it's something else that's sucking your time up and causing that disillusionment. Let me encourage you. God is able, slow down, be still, allow him to help you be present, amen? Get, get back to that a little bit more in a minute. Let's pick up the story and see what happens. Verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, culturally, this was unheard of. It would have been offensive for them to see a father running, let alone after a prodigal son. And so it shows again the heart of the father was he wasn't going to allow his son to just come into a place where others would be looking at him with judgment and contempt. He was going to run. And you need to know when we turn to the Father, when we turn to the Lord, he runs to embrace us. In this moment, that is what is happening. Verse uh, 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again, for he was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. And you need to know again, contextually, they were not coming from the town or the family to celebrate the son. They were coming to support the father who had reconciled and restored his son. There's a difference. The celebration was about what the father was doing. The celebration was about the heart of this father being lived out in a way that they could all see. That's why scripture, just prior to this story, talks about how God the, comes after the lost, comes after the one, and that all of heaven celebrates when even one turns. God wants to celebrate over our lives when we turn to him, church. Can I get an amen? Verse 25, now we see that rebellion isn't just about selfishness, that there was another son, another prodigal, another rebel present. It says, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. Can you imagine? His brother is back and he's angry, he's upset. The father comes out to him and he says, look, these many years, I'm sorry, uh, verse 28, but he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf 
for him. As you think about this, this is the other act of rebellion. Rebellion is not just selfishness, it can be self-righteousness. That, that rebellion and self-righteous living, the older son said, yeah, I mean, can you picture him? He's just standing there. He's watching restoration. He's watching the heart of the Father. He's watching what the Lord is doing and how God is working, and he's standing there on the sidelines going, mm-mm, no. They, don't earn, they didn't earn it. They don't deserve it. I didn't get mine yet. How do they get theirs? Anybody? You ever been around somebody that's been in the church a little too long? And maybe lost a little of Jesus in the process? Ooh, pastor. I mean, the reality is that rebellion takes on both forms. We can get so comfortable in our our, our religiosity and how we're living that we can become self-righteous and forget the heart of the Father and what God wants to do in our midst, restoring and reconciling. And unfortunately, he was missing out just as much as the younger son was. He was missing out in a different way because he was there but not aware of what his father had for him. You see, we can be around the things of God and not be connected to God himself. We can be present, but not experiencing presence. You see, the the father would go on in a minute to tell him, listen, it was always yours, it was always available, I'm right here, if you have me, you have everything you need, all you had to do was ask. And this is the beauty of what Jesus does is he invites us into this relationship where he says, everything the Father has for you is yours. Be present with me. Be present. But sometimes we're in the room but not present. Anybody? Coming into this year, God really started working on my heart around Christmas time. And as he began speaking to me, I began to see that, that I had an issue that, that in fact I was often present in rooms but not fully present. And that God was saying, I want you to be more present. And I've been working on this all year. I'm about six months in, and and I have days where I I really struggle to turn off my mind and to be fully present. Anybody else? Where I've got all these things I'm thinking about and wondering about and even worrying about. And God's trying to help me to see that when I'm in that state, I'm missing out on the presence of those around me and how God wants to work in and through them and even through me. So he gave me a phrase to start the new year. This has been my focus, two words, be there. Can you say that with me? Be there. It's the idea that wherever I am, I wanna be there. I wanna be fully present, attuned to his presence, but also the presence of the people around me trying to turn off things. So I actually, I haven't actually, I didn't say this in first service. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it. I actually got off social media around this, around Christmas. Like if some of you are messaging, I had somebody the other day like, hey, you didn't accept my friend request. I'm like, um, sorry. I've been on there since before Christmas. For me, that was something I had to do to be more there, to be present. It was one lever I could pull to turn off distractions. What do you need to do? may look different than me, but but the whole idea was that, listen, between selfishness and self-righteousness, there's a God who says, "If, if you're fully present with me and those around me, you, I've got more than you know for you. I've got more than you know that I want to provide you and want to do in and through your life. Listen to what he says next, the Father, verse 31 and 32. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother, your, or your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost, and he is found. He's saying, listen, in my presence, you have everything you'll ever need. If you're taking notes here, the Father invites you to come into more than you know, And he shows us that there's three basic things unfolding here. The first is he's communicating with grace and truth. He's communicating to the older son, and he's also done it with the younger son with grace that says, yeah, you screwed up. You you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. That's what grace is. It's God's unmerited favor. 
But I'm also going to give you truth, right? The younger son repented. The older son, we, from what we can tell, he doesn't. But God gives him, through the, the father's example, grace and truth. What does John 1.14 say about Jesus? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. God has more than you know, and he wants to deliver it through his grace and truth. Now the reverse, or the flip of that is true as well, as he delivers it into your life, he wants us to deliver grace and truth to others, amen? Secondly, what do we see here? He invites us into this idea of forgiving with mercy. Actually, he forgives the younger son, lavishes mercy on him at a time where he didn't have to. So another story in the Gospel of John in chapter eight, a woman is caught in adultery. That woman is brought before Jesus by the religious leaders, the self-righteous rebels that are bringing them in front, bringing this woman in front of Jesus to test him. As they stand there, you can picture Jesus and and his heart response is one of forgiveness and mercy. Listen to what he says. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, this is after all of them left. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. What is that? It's forgiveness with mercy It's also grace and truth. It's go and sin no more. You see, we're invited into so much more sometimes than we're receiving and walking in. The last one is the one probably for me that just jumps out the most. It's this idea that the heavenly father has abundance for you and I, living with abundance. Can you say abundance? Can you say abundance like you believe it? Abundance. Come on. You see, many Christians, unfortunately, are living with a scarcity mentality, not an abundance mentality. We serve the God of the universe who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the creator. He is able. He is more than abundant. And he invites you and I, just as the the father said to the older son, hey, if you're with me, he said, you could have just asked. I've got everything you need. Jesus in John 10, 10 lays it out this way. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I wanna just pause there for a minute. You see, the rebellion and the selfishness and the reckless living of the younger son was the enemy attempting to steal, kill, and destroy. But the self-righteousness, the pride, the the rebellion of the older son, the I'm justified in my behavior, that actually was also the enemy's attempt to steal, kill, and destroy because he wasn't getting access to everything God had for him. Are you tracking? But look at what Jesus says. He says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. That that you and I actually, when we walk in a relationship with Jesus, can experience abundant life. When the younger son turned back to the father, he lavished abundance on him. That's the heart of our father. He wants to do, again, more than you know. He wants to do more than we can even hope or imagine, Ephesians 3.20 says. So there's things in life that God may expose in moments like this that we have to let go of. Maybe it's our selfishness, maybe it's our self-righteousness, maybe it's something in between. C.S. Lewis said this, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. Again, not a scarcity mentality, but an abundance. That if the heavenly father is inviting you back, inviting you into a relationship with him, whatever he says to let go of, whatever he exposes is for your good, his glory, and is going to work out far better than anything you're gonna do on your own. Church, There's an invitation to call on Jesus, to call on your heavenly father. My guess is, like you, it's a phone call that sometimes we know we need to make, but we don't necessarily want to make. I mentioned earlier in this service that my earthly father is in the room. I'm so thankful for my dad and who he is and how he shows up. 
There was a moment in childhood where I had really in many ways gone down the path of the younger son. Rebellious, reckless living, very selfish. I was on a path, honestly, to death or destruction in my teen years. During that period, there was moments where they wondered if I, you know, I'm sure if I was gonna make it. Dad said something key to me. He said, he said and he always provided discipline, right? <laughs> like, he always provided discipline. But he also said at one point, listen, if there's ever a moment where you're so in trouble that you don't know where to turn or what to do, you can call me no matter what. I think it's a phone call he hoped never came. But when I was 17 and my brother was 15, that phone call came. You see, we had gone out and I took my brother to his first house party. And we were selfish and reckless. We were out of control. And as we were with others and everything unfolded, there was a point at which the home was surrounded by the police. At least 20 of them, maybe more from what we could tell. They raided the house. We got out of the house into the woods. This was a Michigan winter, so as we went out into the woods, unfortunately my brother fell in the middle of winter into a creek. He got really wet. Hypothermia began to set in, but we had to wait until the house cleared. When the cops then staked out the rest of the area around there, but the house was available, we snuck back in. I carried my brother. I carried him back into the house, set him in a tub of hot water, and realized that we were stuck. So I made the phone call. I said, Dad, I'm really sorry. But you said I could always call. Here's what's the situation, here's what's happened. Will you come get us? I don't know what went through his mind in that moment, but I saw his heart because he said, absolutely, I'll be there. He drove through the police barricade. He told them, you're not touching them, you didn't catch them. They're my sons, I'm bringing them home. Put us in the car, took us home. Again, there was great discipline to be had. <laughs> but God did more than I think my dad even knew was possible showing us the heart of the Father. And now today, those two knuckleheads are both pastors. What does God want you to do today? What call do you need to make to him to say, God, forgive me. God, I'm turning to you. Because just like he drove through anything to get to us, your heavenly Father is ready to rush in to your reality. I have one question for you today, one next step question, that is it. Will you come to Jesus today and receive all that he has for you? He has so much more than you and I know. And I believe he's there with arms wide open, whether we're the younger son, the older son, or something in between, saying, come to me, call on me, I'm here for you, I have so much more I wanna do in and through your life. If you'll bow your heads, I'm gonna just pray us into a response. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you, Jesus, for your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that no matter what we are going through, where we find ourselves, we can call on you. Father, I pray that you would forgive us for our rebellion, whether we're selfish or self-righteous, maybe both or something in between. God, I pray that this moment would be led by you, that we would call on your name, that we would turn to you, that you, Heavenly Father, would rush in and do more than we even know. We thank you for grace and truth. We thank you for forgiveness and mercy. We thank you for the abundant life that you invite us into. So Jesus, have your way right now as we call on you. We thank you in Jesus' name.